All right, so I'm going to begin. And before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that Queen's University and the Agnes Sutherington Arts Centre are situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it. People whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop its relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. This beautiful land, the trees, the three waterways nearby, the animals and birds are an inspiration and a solace during these difficult times. And we are grateful and privileged to be able to live, work, play, create, celebrate and heal in our communities on this land. I welcome you all to spend some time researching and reflecting on the land that you are coming from and to consider your own positionality and how you can contribute contribute to the work of decolonizing your institutions, your bodies, and your minds. So welcome everyone. My name is Shannon Brown. I am the program coordinator at Agnes Sutherington Arts Centre and we're just thrilled to have you here. We're also thrilled to present two wonderful speakers, Stephen Legary and Melissa Smith. The uh, speaker series will start today um, with me presenting, uh, uh, sorry, me introducing Stephen with his bio, and then uh, we will go to Melissa for her presentation. And then we'll have about a half an hour, 25 minutes or so Q&A. So I do encourage you to think about your questions. Please put them into the Q&A chat box as soon as you can, so that we can collate all those uh, questions for Melissa and Stephen. All right, so let's begin with Stephen Legary. Stephen Legary holds a master's in creative arts therapies from Concordia University and a master's in couple and family therapy from the so School of Social Work at McGill University. Legary is the program officer for the art therapy, for art therapy at the Museum of, Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. This comprehensive museum-based program creates specialized projects for diverse groups, including neuroatypical adults, adults with disabilities, and those living with long-term illness, trauma, and grief. Legary is in constant search of new ways for the fine arts to be a source of connection and recovery. Welcome, Stephen. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, Shannon. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And I'd like to say a special thank you as well to Maddie and Charlotte for all of the support getting to this moment. Um, I'm going to launch into my uh, presentation fairly quickly. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, one of my colleagues is here today, at least one of my colleagues is here today. It's really nice to see them uh, in the virtual audience. Um, so let me just bring up my presentation. Bye -bye. Let me bring up the beginning of my presentation. <laughs> you can see where I was scanning through. One moment, please. Thank you for your patience. Good. All right. So in responding to the theme of art and wellness, I'd like to focus sort of specifically on um, what we've been able to practice at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Um, uh, in the case of my colleagues for the better part of 20 years, but then also what I've had the great privilege of learning over the past few years from other museums and how those practices have collectively helped us inform what we hope is um, uh, a consistent, um, a consistency striving towards best practice uh, in museum wellness, in museum art therapy, uh, and in museum inclusion programs. Um, this is uh, a site that I miss very much. Um, I think for everybody working with museums right now, those who have uh, closed doors, there's a, a great sense of um, longing and missing both of our institutions, uh, how they can be supportive to us, but it really comes down to missing um, the publics, of missing the groups. 
Um, and that's what I'm really hoping to share with you today is that the, the, um, the connection that we are able to make with people in the museums, in our relationship to the fine arts, is at the fulcrum of how um, arts and health can be appreciated in a fine art museum context. And it's in the absence of those groups that we really feel, um, one, the, the, the impact of maybe what we had accomplished up until uh, moving into virtual formats, and then also how to think more critically about how to return to working with them. I'm gonna be pausing um, at the end of my presentation to look at some of the works uh, that I picked out from the Agnes collection. Um, the, the way that we use the fine arts at the museum, uh, there's a myriad of ways that they're used, uh, both from more traditional educational perspectives, um, but working both in therapy and in wellness, um, we're often working in a perspective of eliciting story. What we really hope is that our, our participants are going to respond to the works in a way that is personal. And sometimes that's actually irrespective of the, the art history information that comes with a work. Um, we invite people to tell their stories, to take wanderings, um, to like, to dislike, uh, to project, um, and the way that I use that specifically in art therapy is often as a precursor to the more uh, deep work that we're going to explore through art making and then through therapeutic reflection. And this one's for me. I'm, I'm starting with this one because uh, it caught my attention immediately. There's a beautiful word um, in French, uh, which is, uh, is it, uh, it's not accroche? I'll, I'll remember it in just a second, but um, this caught me because I'm from Ottawa. I grew up in, in the Ottawa Valley and um, the title of this work is October Ottawa Valley by Sour Margaret Armour Robertson. And um, this is where I would long to be this coming weekend is with my family. And uh, so in identifying a personal story with the work, um, I allowed myself to take a, a little bit of a pause in the busyness of both preparing for today um, but also all the other things that are going on uh, in relationship to, to working in a museum virtually at this time. And I took a walk through the hills. I paused under the, um, uh, the kind of peach colored leaves that are falling and, uh, and tried to imagine where, where in the valley this might actually be, but perhaps more importantly, where in the valley it reminds me of being. Um, so when we come to the end of the presentation, I have a few works that are mostly based around nature and I'll invite you to do the same thing. Uh, so welcome to our front door. Uh, again, a site that we miss very much. Uh, the heyday of summer, um, times of uh, exciting big exhibitions. And um, uh, so as I said, I'm gonna be mostly focusing on the different kinds of programs that we have that are focused around wellness, art therapy and inclusion. Um, this is a sprawling museum. If you haven't visited it, there are five pavilions. We have an encyclopedic collection uh, and we have a beautiful facility in the International Atelier uh, Michel de la Chalinière, where we have um, more than a dozen studios that we get to do both educational and wellness programming in. Um, there's a lot of information that I could share about uh, either the history or um, the current activities uh, of the ensemble. This is a, a large team that we're talking about, um, but I'm going to try to just give you a little bit of a, of a visit, almost like we're visiting little different islands um, throughout the museum. And then if you have more specific questions, I'd be really happy to answer them later. Um, I would also like to make my own acknowledgement that I am speaking to you from the unceded territory of Jojake. And I include um, Charles Joseph's totem when I make the acknowledgement, uh, though it's obviously not from this part of our country. This is, however, a totem that is erected in, and remains in front of our museum. Um, for me, it's a, a daily reminder uh, to listen and to learn and uh, quite an incredible testament. It's called a residential school totem. So quite a testament to the power of art, not only to communicate um, a very a personal and shared traumatic experience, but also the healing potential of the arts. Some key words, uh, again, this is mostly for myself because I like to talk and I get off topic easily. So we are talking about how the fine arts in a museum serve connection, empowerment, empathy, compassion, uh, mindful presence, the building of trusting relationships, 
and the communication of care. And I'd like to start also by paying tribute to other museums. Um, we, have a, we have a big and robust program um, that we're, we're proud to boast about, uh, but it's really important to pay tribute to all those museums that are inspiring our programs and that we can collaborate with and share with. And this is something that I've noticed particularly uh, since we've gone virtual is the sharing between museums has become um, a little bit more organic the opportunity to meet with colleagues in different education and well-being departments um, has really bolstered my appreciation and understanding of what's out there. Uh, so this is our, our friends and colleagues in Dallas um, who we've collaborated with uh, specifically on a project around neurodiversity. Um, this is the Contemporary Museum in Athens, uh, Greece. And my friend Elizabeth runs the art psychotherapy program there. Um, they were a museum that opened not even that long ago into the new year and then subsequently had to close, uh, adjust, uh, create virtual content, uh, and then in the anticipation of reopening and relaunching their therapy programs. This is the ROM. Um, this is their commitment to diversity inclusion, uh, particularly in response to the murder of George Floyd, as many museums made important statements about their own commitments. Uh, this is part of their action plan moving forward. So when we think about health, wellness, well-being, uh, we're not only talking about physical health, we're not only talking about mental health, we're talking about social health as well and our respective responsibilities to our communities. This is in Bergamo, Italy, where I had the great fortune of visiting last year. Uh, Bergamo, as you may know, uh, was particularly hard hit in the um, earliest phases of the spread of COVID. Overwhelmed um, would be a word. And, um, this is a local hospital called Humanitas, who did a collaboration with the uh, Academia Carrara, uh, just down the street actually. And the entire hospital staff was involved in choosing their favorite works from the museum so that they could be um, in, in very beautiful reproduction, reproduced in mural format uh, throughout the hospital, thus making it a museum as well uh, for patients, for visitors of patients and for staff. Uh, and you, have a, you get, a, get a little map when you go there and you can actually visit the different wards uh, and appreciate the works that have been chosen. The use here of St. Jerome taking the um, thorn out of the lion's uh, paw is particularly poignant as it greets you coming into the hospital as if to say, here um, we take care uh, in the most uh, careful and sensitive ways, um, no matter how um, distressed you may be. This is a great uh, graphic novel project that came out of the Gulag History Museum in Russia, which I recently learned about. And they also run therapeutic programs uh, with people who have uh, survived the Gulags. Uh, a fascinating um, uh, number of different projects and I encourage you to visit their website to learn more about it. Um, this is the National Gallery in Ireland, also uh, a great inspiration for different kinds of sensory programming. Um, I got to visit them on holiday last year and was greeted with what you might imagine uh, the most wonderful Irish hospitality. Um, the Louvre Abu Dhabi is a recent collaboration. They self-identify as a mindful museum. It's a young museum still with quite an incredible collection and also the most uh, awe-inspiring architecture built right onto the edge of the sea. Um, as we identify as a humanist museum in Montreal, I find that these words um, are, are not only uh, ways to brand ourselves, of course, but they are invitation to interrogate, interrogate what that actually means. And so one of the things that I've been able to do with um, their teams there is just have uh, these conversations about what does mindfulness mean across a museum and not only as an orientation to uh, help visitors. And then right here at the Agnes. Um, so uh, this is just one of your initiatives, moving your hive online, uh, keeping people connected, um, not only through directing people to the collections that we have available, the educational activities that we have available, um, but an increasing, happily to say, an increasing um, presence of community-oriented work in our museums. Uh, this was really a heartwarming picture for me to see and, and screen grab for the presentation. And if uh, all the things that I'm sharing aren't enough uh, to convince you, even the WHO uh, has evidence that um, 
the arts supports health and well-being. They released a scoping review in 2019 that looked at uh, the best of the best of research to, to support our interactions with the performing arts, the creation of arts ourselves, um, and museums are also included in this first review as well. Um, I really enjoy this quote bringing into people's lives through activities, including dancing, singing, and going to museums and concerts, offers an added dimension to how we improve physical and mental health, that from the regional director. Um, they're currently working on a second review that will include a lot more focus on the creative arts therapies, which I'm looking forward to. I take a big breath when I look at these images because uh, they remind me to breathe. And um, I'm really interested in how design, light, and architecture, particularly with some of our more recent cons constructions, uh, this is our most recent pavilion, uh, Pavilion for Peace, how those elements support the experiences that we're trying to share with our audiences, with our publics, with our participants, uh, whether they've come to us as patients or they've come to us as tourists. Um, and there's some really interesting research into what's called therapeutic architecture. Um, this is a space that uh, people have gone through many different kinds of reflections from reposing themselves on the cushions below the Otoniel sculpture um, or, uh, or taking careful steps uh, down, uh, this is in the main pavilion, but taking careful steps uh, one at a time in this kind of displaced fashion. Um, the steps encourage you and even force you to be present in what you're doing. So the physical relationship to a museum um, is a really interesting uh, place for occupational therapists, uh, for people that are interested in mobility issues, um, that our museums are about at once having an encounter with the fine arts and each other, but also there are places where our bodies move through space and encounter each other. And then the conception of galleries. If we look at the top image, this is the, the gallery that houses our romantic collection. And it's a room that we use in a variety of ways. Um, when I'm using it with therapeutic groups, uh, we, we try to get in there early in the day before any of the crowds get in. And uh, it again is a room that breathes. It's a room that has been conceived um, to support and bathe us in nature. Um, and this has been a really interesting motif that's come back almost relentlessly uh, since uh, the, the imposition of COVID, which is people's connections not only to the literal land, uh, but through the fine arts, there's been this ongoing demand through the groups that I'm doing to connect with images of nature. Um, it, anytime I ask for, for feedback from groups, what would you like to see more of? Um, it's, a, it's almost a, an insatiable appetite. Um, so this is a very special room includes uh, sounds of birds. Uh, they're, they're really, they're, they're used with a lot of restraint as well, so that you really feel that you can immerse yourself into the environment. Um, and it's definitely one of the places that I love to visit. This is our colleague, Marilyn. Um, and it's really important to talk briefly. I could talk at length and, and she could give you a masterclass um, in the history of sharing the museum, which again is more than 20 years old and is really the, as Louise and I like to say, Louise is my colleague um, who runs the, the wellness uh, program. Uh, it's the trunk of the tree from which uh, all of our programs sprang. And it really reached out with that initial question of who isn't coming to the museum and why aren't they coming to the museum and what projects can we build together? And that very simple, straightforward gesture of invitation uh, is what allowed us um, through a couple of decades of practice and reflection to have as robust a program as we do. Um, there's a long, long list of partners that we owe a great debt to who have taught us so much um, and have helped us uh, become a better team, a more proficient team, have helped us learn about best practice. Um, and there's something like 450 of them in our Rolodex. Um, a lot of those relationships continue to be maintained today in various frequencies. Um, and this, uh, I believe, is, a, is an image from uh, one of the number of, of different groups of people living with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, which was originally inspired by Meet Me at the MoMA. And it was adapted um, both to the culture of our own museum and to the culture of Montreal as well. Uh, and it's definitely a long running and successful program today. Um, Beautiful Thursdays or Les Beaux Jeudis uh, is a program that's been running literally for years now um, and opens wide the doors every Thursday. There's now two groups every Thursday. 
um, for free for seniors, for art making, for stretching, for yoga, for some movement, for exploration of uh, works of art, um, and really to give uh, a privileged place to um, our elders, our, our sages um, and our seniors, uh, for them to have a place at the table that's just for them, and then also to reinforce um, uh, part of the mandate of our department, which is really to have intergenerational programming. Um, and Louise could say so much about this programming as well, but um, in, in, in writ large, uh, there are programs for children with adapted special learning needs that have been running for many different years. And um, one of the things that I want to underline is our, our model is based on one of co-creation, whether that's co-creating and partnering with a special educator, a clinician, a nurse, a psychologist, a parent, a volunteer. We're never really sure who our next partner is going to be and what professional or life experience is going to lend to us being able to um, expand or even specialize in what we do. Um, but all of those projects invariably involve the collection. So the connection to the museum's collection is essential. And then often it also um, has a connection to a creative activity. So that hands-on physical work of play, of exploration, of discovery, of enjoyment. Um, and in the case of my own program, of being able to explore things that are uh, sensitive, difficult, problematic, and traumatic as well. Um, another great project uh, is working with uh, Parkinson's en Mouvement that Louise has been uh, taking care of for a couple of years now. Um, again, to imagine that our gallery spaces are not only for looking, but that they are for moving, that our bodies have an important role in responding to the works as well, uh, that, uh, that the way that art can reflect back our experience is not exclusively um, intellectual and in fact getting that dimension out of the way uh, is some of the hard work that we do so that people can have a sensory, uh, sensual um, and um, an embodied experience uh, in interacting with the visual and fine arts. And then our, our dear friend and colleague Morija um, heads up the Togetherness and Diversity program. Um, he's currently working with several organizations that uh, bring together communities that have either previously participated in the museum um, or are coming to the museum for the first time. And again, in that same spirit of co-creation, of visiting, of discussion, um, and um, to, to with the, the ongoing objective of, of this image, uh, which now hangs in, in the, the atelier, in the grand atelier, um, where we all work, uh, so that this actually one day will be the image that we strive to, to look like. Um, one of the more interesting developments that came out of, uh, again, all these years of work and of working specifically with hospitals, clinics, and healthcare workers was we gained the interest and attention of an association of mainly family doctors. Um, L'Association des Médecins Francophones du Canada is um, uh, an association that brings together family doctors from across Canada who are working towards um, either supporting or, or proficiency in offering uh, best practice medicine in the French language. And they loved the idea of creating or co-creating uh, a museum prescription with us. We ran a pilot project in 2018 and saw about 350 prescriptions filled for individuals, their families, or a couple, or you could come with your friend as well. It was really about um, underlining the autonomy of the patient to be able to decide for themselves what kind of experience did they want to have um, but mainly that they would be able to trade in this prescription um, for access in a way that allowed them to become then a museum participant and leave the label of patient at the door if that was their choosing. And also to connect with those different programs that we were mentioning earlier, and I'll mention the Art Hive later, which has been a place that um, a number of people who have used their prescription have found their way to. Specifically in art therapy, um, there are a number of projects that I would love to tell you about in great detail, um, but I'm going to stick to a few. So this is one that um, uh, ran for two years and is now under what I would call uh, an evaluation phase. Um, it, we were approached by a local organization uh, that supports people through in-home end-of-life care, and they were looking to start um, a bereavement program. And this was not something that I had specifically done before at the museum. 
Um, some of our other works with people who um, are living with long-term and even terminal illness, we certainly are encountering issues of, of, of mortality and existential questioning, but to really focus on a, a project that uh, would welcome and embrace people's uh, grief process was, was something new to build. And um, so I started with the collection, uh, looking for works that I hoped would inspire people to be able to open up about their experience of grief. And this was co-created and co-facilitated by a social worker. And we met uh, eight times uh, bi-weekly with a group of eight adults. Um, uh, we did it once, we evaluated it, we launched the program again. And now it's informing um, a new project that I'm hoping to start in the new year with uh, a local palliative care center. We've been working now into our third year with a center for restorative justice. And um, the work that we do with them is to support people who self-identify as victims of, um, of uh, criminal violence. And uh, this is what, what we might call a semi-open group of self-selecting participants, as opposed to being referred participants. And uh, they're able to come mostly on a monthly format. I say mostly because we're now moving to a bi-weekly format virtually. Uh, but mostly in a monthly format, um, we focus our visits on a single work of art. We then go back to the studio uh, and we have um, a non-directive art making session and then invite people into a reflective process where they dialogue with their artwork and with each other, um, which often leads to them um, disclosing about different traumatic experiences that they've had in their life, but then also being able to be um, of co-support uh, to the other members. And this is really something to be underlined that we really emphasize group work because the group dynamic is what often is the, the primary healing factor uh, in what people are, are deriving from the work that we do. Um, working with a local clinic that supports young adults with different uh, communication problems, sometimes that's deafness, sometimes that's stuttering, um, sometimes that's uh, aphasia. And we've now moved into year five of this project and it's now becoming a research project which we're quite excited about. So we've got um, the interest um, both of uh, researchers at UCAM and uh, right in the clinic itself. It's co-facilitated with a psychologist and a speech therapist, has the presence of an interpreter, um, project that Louise worked, worked on as well. And, um, it's mainly focused on uh, helping these young adults have uh, a supported experience uh, in a museum environment where they can practice uh, interacting not only with the artworks, uh, with people who aren't living with communication problems, but also having that, um, that shared lived experience of hearing their stories um, through others. And because I know the Agnes is, um, a center that uh, is really invested in research. I thought I'd bring out a few examples um, to share as well. Um, so a project that we're now um, turning into a chapter on group art therapy. Uh, we ran um, a series of groups uh, since 2017 in collaboration with the Quebec Breast Cancer Foundation, uh, who helped us with recruitment and helped us um, by understanding the needs of their membership, which is something we always ask our partners to do. And this is a collaboration with UCAP, Université Québec on the BTP Temeskimang, and uh, the lead researcher there is Jacinthe Lambert, who's both an art therapist and a psychologist. And we were really looking at, once again, the lived is 100% qualitative, um, this particular, um, more of a phenomenological study, uh, that uh, two of those groups got followed through a series of of 10 sessions. Our sessions typically last about three hours each. Um, and that includes a visit, that includes art making, and that includes therapeutic reflection. And this one was co-facilitated by an art therapy intern and by one of our um, veteran uh, mediators. In Quebec, we use the term mediator uh, as opposed to, or mediator, as opposed to um, educator, not an opposition to it, um, but it's a, a term that we borrowed, uh, it's more prominently used uh, in Europe and in France, um, appreciating the dynamic of our educators as being that medium between the visitor experience and the artworks um, to strive towards that horizontality uh, of relationship um, in, their, in their role. 
And so this, this group again benefited from a number of uh, custom made visits uh, to select artworks to invite the reflection of, uh, of the eight women that were in each group, all of which, uh, who, all of whom I should say, um, were at different stages of their treatment. They could have been in treatment or in remission for several years. We had a pretty broad recruitment uh, criteria. And um, I'm going to share with you just some of, uh, of their reflections, uh, themes that would include um, a sanctuary. So we would have visited again that, uh, that romantic uh, collection gallery earlier and invited each of them to reflect on uh, what does a sanctuary mean for you. We would have explored um, themes of body image and doing body traces. We would have also explored um, of themes of uh, finding uh, a place in the museum that feels like a safe space to you in that given moment. Um, which could be quite a bit of work at times. Um, and then they would come back, here's, a, here's an example of uh, the work around sanctuary, and they would be given a variety of materials to be able to uh, express their reflective process of that visit, of the theme, and then also um, just what's present for them that day. Um, in art therapy particularly, people are free to reject the themes, they're free to reject the directives, they're free to reject the materials even. Um, they, they can really explore what is most important for them, but there's often an appreciation of that frame around um, how we're exploring the, uh, the work together. This is working with the breath. This would have been in relationship to the uh, sculpture that I showed just a couple of frames back where you're finding your spot and then doing a mindful exercise in relationship to the work. Um, I'll just throw up a few other uh, examples of research that we've done. This was by Ellen Smallwood, who's a recent graduate of our Concordia Art Therapy Program and did a pilot mixed methods study uh, working with young adults uh, who are living with epilepsy. Some of our projects were really interesting in that they've been able to address underserved publics, or sometimes in clinical terms, what we call populations. Um, I prefer the term publics, and we tend to in the museum as well, um, that don't previously have either an association or a group. And that's sometimes the interest of researchers to use the museum as kind of this novel environment to create a group and then go off into their, um, into their own uh, partnering um, location and, and continue that work, but then also continue to have a relationship with the museum. Uh, that's an example that we had with a, a young group for young adults living with cancer. It's an ongoing group now at the Canadian uh, Cancer Foundation, uh, but they still make periodic visits to the museum uh, in the accompaniment of their art therapist. Uh, this past year, we did a pilot study for uh, adults living with stroke in what's called the chronic phase, so post six months. We already knew that art therapy uh, was a good idea and was helpful in the early stages post stroke. And we wanted to see what was it, uh, what was it, and also in combining it with uh, the museum visits, what were the advantages um, for and this was an ensemble of five different universities, people, everything from um, rehabilitation to, um, to occupational therapy. Um, there's a whole sort of, uh, host of researchers who were interested in their own, uh, their own research and their own perspective on working with this particular population. And so they're looking at the data right now and hopefully I'll have something in the next year to share. Um, more in the well-being side of, uh, of our program, this is a, a major uh, study that's out of its pilot phase, even though I'm still using this screen, looking at the benefits of, of uh, museum art-based experiences for older adults um, who are living with things like uh, social isolation, anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem. And so building off of the model of our Beautiful Thursdays, um, the head researcher who's um, uh, an expert in gerontology, wanted to look at that uh, creative activity, that social activity. Um, it's not going to surprise anybody that they got positive results. It turns out going to a museum, connecting, hanging out, making art, and uh, being warmly welcomed um, has a positive impact on all those symptoms I described. Uh, what's exciting though is it's now being reproduced in more than five museums worldwide. 
And the one thing that we don't do enough of, um, and I'm informed by this by Canadian researchers, well, Canada's great at pilot studies, we don't reproduce enough research. And so that's a, an invitation to us all to borrow each other's research and launch, launch our, own, uh, our own reproductions of them. And then the art hive. I encourage you to, um, uh, to watch the video of Janice Timbotos to visit arthives.org to learn more about the hives, about the international movement, about where it comes from, about hopefully where it's going, about the virtual adaptations, about Agnes's own art hive. Um, we've had an art hive at the museum since 2017. It's been a wonderful, successful model of a community-focused studio. Um, and uh, we've, we've had to move already to a larger facility within the museum because it's such a popular space. Um, we see about, I just did some, some figures, we see about 2,500 people coming through um, the hive every year based on a twice weekly access. And then the other days of the week, that same studio can serve purposes to our other groups, be they for uh, closed therapeutic groups or for well-being groups as well. Um, but, the art hive principles are fairly straightforward. Everyone is welcomed as an art maker. Um, we, practice, we practice what's called radical hospitality. Um, we try to let people know within the first, first few moments of being there that, um, and that's mostly through presence and regard, um, but they are warmly welcomed if this is a place that they choose uh, to find safe for them. Uh, materials are free. Uh, we underline and support the autonomy of everyone to make their own work. And, um, and to make their own decisions about what that should look like, but then to also celebrate them as teachers themselves, that everyone has something to share, uh, be it story, be it craft, uh, or be it technique um, with the other uh, community members that are there. And in the museums, we're very lucky because we have both people that come every week, twice a week. We have families that come, thus creating a more intergenerational space, but we also benefit from tourism. And so uh, our museum before it closed was enjoying about a million visitors a year. And um, that means that some percentage of them were just stopping by haphazardly to go, hey, what's, what's in here? So you get, to, you get to catch someone, you know, at the tail end of their holiday sometimes before they go back to a different part of the world and get to kind of turn them on to the, the art hive um, for a couple of hours. And people often leave um, with a, a sense of, of having something done very different at a fine art museum than they would have anticipated. I'm gonna run through the last few slides. I wanna make sure that I keep time. Something, I'll just scroll through these slides quickly. Uh, something that I've been working on with some colleagues in the States is um, co-developing uh, a teaching model uh, for what does it mean to be a trauma-informed or a trauma-aware museum. Uh, we've had a lot of good research in education in what trauma-informed schools look like. Um, but there wasn't enough for our museum art educators. And so that was a question that they came uh, and I came together with uh, to explore the different tools that we could share to help our teams and then to also um, support other museums that are asking this question. Uh, speaking of research, uh, the AAM has been busy polling uh, museum patrons to ask them questions about the roles of museum post COVID and um, they have particular tasks for history museums and their tasks for fine art museums, what they kind of lump in with visiting botanical gardens and zoos as well, is to remember that the work that you're already doing is the work that people are waiting for, which is that these are seen as almost as palliative environments, palliative in the best sense of being cared for and cared for in a very sensitive um, and authentic way. Uh, so the, the programs that we've, that we've had the great privilege of developing um, are what's being yearned for when we can physically be back in our museums uh, once again. And now for a breath. Um, could I invite you, the audience, those that are in attendance, um, if you would be so kind to visit a few of the works that I've pre-selected uh, from the Agnes collection that are mostly that are all actually uh, in some way related to this, um, this appetite for scenes of nature uh, at this time. And I've intentionally not put the name of the artist, the date, the medium used, um, which is not proper protocol when you're presenting artworks in a, in a formal capacity, um, but in a, in a well-being or therapeutic capacity, just wanna invite you to, um, if you would use the chat, 
respond with a few words um, with what comes up for you. Uh, that can be a feeling, that can be a color. And if I could ask for some, some help either seeing those words or if someone would like to, um, that's helping to facilitate this, if you could just say the few words that you're seeing come up in the chat. Stephen, we have peace, wind through the trees, calm, reflective, wander, patience, breath, a dreamlike noticing, warmth, reflective space, warm sunlight on the skin, slowness, calmness, stillness, beauty, sanctuary, chilling. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to move into a, a couple of more because they're, they're all, they're all quite remarkable. Again, um, whatever words first come to you. Loneliness, mm. silence, cold, slow, reflective, mystery, isolation, anguish, survived, Thank solitude. You. I, I, could, I could stay on the image for half an hour, but I'm, I'm, I want to be very respectful of time. Uh, I have two more images. This is the second to last. Any words that come to you? Tethered, trauma, the United States now, mm. death, predator, action, aggressive, mm. complexity, chained, embrace, Thank you, Shen. I'm sorry, the last one was resistance? Yes. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, I got one more. Glow, hope, mm. balance, orb, radiate, radiance, nature, many voices, positive vibes, mm. equilibre, shine. Shine. Into mm -hmm. Thank you. And this is my own closing image. Um, this isn't in our museum, but you can see it from our museum. And it's the um, one of our one of our great uh, late Montrealers, uh, Leonard Cohen. Um, the often even overused phrase, or the often even overused quote of his, I, I can't help but. Um, repeat as often as possible at the time, which is um, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And uh, certainly an important reminder to us of the role of the arts um, in the work that we're doing now, but also in the grief and healing that we have to come. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, such a beautiful offering. You've really taken us around the world. You've taken us into our hearts um, and shown us so much potential. And uh, I know there's some questions coming in. We look forward to chatting a little bit more with you about your presentation. So thank you so much. Wow. I'm going to move on now to Melissa, who will, I'm sure as well, have such uh, rich content for us. So get your notebooks ready, everyone. Um, Melissa Smith is the Assistant Curator of Community Programs at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Her responsibilities include inclusive public programs for adults and accessibility advocacy. Motivated by a sustained commitment to exploring the unique relationship between art and audiences, Smith was awarded the Royal Ontario Museum Visitor Engagement Award in 2014, and one of Smith's AGO programs was awarded the 2016 People's Choice for Quality Improvement by the City of Toronto Long-Term Care Home and Services. She holds a Master of Arts in Art History from Western University and a Master's of Museum Studies from the University of Toronto. 
She is also a sessional instructor in the Inclusive Design Graduate Program at OCAD U and sits on the Board of Directors at the Miles Nadal Jewish Community Center. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always so embarrassing to hear your <laughs> bio read sometimes, I think, but thank you for that wonderful invitation, Shannon. And Stephen, I'm absolutely blown away. And uh, it's also your energy and your pre presenting is so wonderful too. Um, and thank you, Maddie and Charlotte for support as well. Just so happy to be here with everyone. I'm gonna start to share my screen and throughout the presentation, um, awkwardly move between the slides. So we'll, <laughs> we'll have fun with that today as well. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm located in Takaranto on lands that are the traditional homes of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee, and I'm grateful to live and work on this land. Recognizing this is a, a meaningful way to really make a commitment uh, to sharing and upholding responsibilities to all who now live on these lands. So um, yeah, just an important, I think, way to start. So. I also thought just to give a little bit of context about what the Art Gallery of Ontario is. So I'm gonna move through some of just foundational information and then some mission and vision stuff that I just think is helpful in understanding how and, and why we engage in the work of well-being. Um, so the AGO is located in Toronto and is one of the largest art museums in North America, uh, attracting approximately 1 million visitors annually in pre-COVID days. Uh, the AGO collection of more than 105,000 works of art ranges from contemporary art to masterpieces by Indigenous and Canadian artists, as well as some European art. The AGO presents wide ranging exhibitions and programs, including solo exhibitions and acquisitions by diverse artists from around the world. And in 2019, which um, I think is really important to note in this context, the AGO launched an, initi an initiative designed to make the museum more welcoming and accessible. And we did this by introducing free admission for anyone who was 25 years old and under, and also uh, introducing a $35 annual pass so you can visit as many times as you like. Um, and also wanted to acknowledge, just to understand how we work, that the AGO is funded in part by the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Culture Industries. And then additionally operating support is received from the City of Toronto, the Canada Council of the Arts, and contributions from AGO members, donors, and private sector partners. I'm always a little nosy about how things work, so that's, that's why I thought I would share that with everyone. I'm also going to switch into our uh, vision and mission, which again, I think is just important to know where we're coming from as an institution. So the AGO will lead global conversations from Toronto through extraordinary collections, exhibitions and programs, and by reflecting the people who live here. And our core values are really just quite straightforward, art, audience or visitors, and learning. Um, and I'm gonna dive even a bit further and share uh, also what my specific department, so I work in the Public Programming and Learning Division. Um, and what we really believe is that we will generate meaningful, experimental and inclusive experiences connecting people, art and contemporary ideas. And also sharing some of our guiding principles because again, feeling like this gets us on the same page. So we seek to be relevant in our audiences and everything we do, uh, be a platform for visual arts and culture, shape unique experiences for multiple communities and cultures, consider the full diversity of our visitors and generate experiences that embrace the communities we serve, generate opportunities that engage and deepen relationships with all our audiences, and ensure that we take risks in our work while recognizing varied experiences. And I have to say that this is a whole team of people um, and we really work with community across our department through school programs, youth programs, performances, art talks. So I'm very lucky to work with some very amazing folks. But yeah, just to kind of get a sense of how we do. I also wanted to chat a little bit too about our methodology. So the gallery takes on a constructivist approach to programming in order to really centralize the visitor or program participant. And theorist George Hine describes the philosophy from a museum perspective, stating that constructivism accommodates personal meaning making 
and provides opportunities for visitors to validate and express their own interpretations. And this perspective really encourages visitors to participate rather than passively receive information, which is super, super important to us. During all of our art educator led programs, participants are encouraged to contribute to conversations by responding to open ended questions with methodologies like Philip Yanowin and Abigail Hausen's visual thinking strategy. So that's the one with the three questions. What's going on in this picture. What do you see that makes you say that and what more can we find um, And this really supports dialogue and creates space for varied perspectives, which is so important. We do this because we know from museum visitor research, and this is the saddest thing, that the number one reason people don't visit art galleries specifically is because they feel they need to come equipped with an art history knowledge, which is, again, so sad because we can all make meaning when looking at visual culture. We're surrounded by it, if not inundated by it. And for me, the most important reason to undo this perception is that museums actually improve our well-being and health. And that really brings us to the point of why I'm chatting today also. And I want to identify and really lean into some of the things that uh, Stephen also talked about. How health and well-being is not just the absence of illness or disease. Well-being is a dynamic process that gives people a sense of how their lives are going. So through the interaction between their circumstances, activities, and psychological resources or mental capital. As the World Health Organization claimed more than 60 years ago, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that's so important, right? Health should be promoted more broadly by leaning into positive well-being and its origins and cultural value systems, and maintenance through social processes. And these are outlined typically as the social determinants of health. And again, something that Stephen touched about in his uh, presentation. The World Health Organization defines social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. So just about everything. <laughs> and the organization further states that these circumstances are shaped by the distribution, which is very important to acknowledge, of money, power, and resources at a global, national, and local level. So examples of social determinants of health include income level, educational opportunities, occupation, employment status, and workplace safety, gender inequity, racial segregation, food insecurity and inaccessibility of nutritious food choices, access to housing and utility services, early childhood experiences and development, social support and community inclusivity, crime rates and exposure to violent behavior, availability of transportation, neighborhood conditions and physical environment, access to safe drinking water, clean air and toxin-free environments, and last but not least, access to culture, recreation and leisure. Bear, like that is identified. So, and the reason I like to go through this too is because this is what I use as a means of encouraging programming. So, and it also underlines why access to art and culture sites is actually human right. So irrespective of cognitive sensory or physically uh, physical ability, um, really, and this is all covered by the article, article 27 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in Canada, we have the Canadian Rights Act and Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's super important to note because engagement with the arts can aid in tackling complex challenges for which medical solutions are not adequate. So we can provide mental, multiple health promoting factors in a single activity, connect with hard to reach groups and foster preventative and promotional health behavior. And evidence actually shows that engaging with museums provides positive social experiences, reducing social isolation, opportunities for learning and acquiring new skills, calming experiences leading to decreased anxiety, increased positive emotions such as optimism, hope, and enjoyment, increased self-esteem and sense of identity, increased inspiration and opportunities for meaning making, positive distraction from clinical environments. If you're coming as someone who's looking to create a or participate in a service related to community health centers or um, hospitals. Uh, increased communication among families, caregivers, and health professionals as well. And this is from a study done by uh, Chatterjee and Nobel. 
And to get even more specific and relate this to art galleries, Heather Stuckey and Jeremy Nabal in a review of empirical literature concluded that engagement with artistic activities, either as an observer of the creative efforts of others or as an initiator of their own creative efforts, um, can enhance mood, emotions, and other psychological states. And a more recent report, so the one that Stephen also acknowledged, um, found that art specifically has positive overall effects for mental and physical health at all stages of life. So with the research providing a strong foundation, we know that cultural institutions have begun to explore what their contributions can be to public health and well-being. And again, thank you, Stephen, for just running through all of those amazing programs, because we can see that that's happening around the world and in Montreal. All of these facts and findings are also what I share regularly, so I'm kind of going through my spiel, to encourage funding and priority setting in my institution. And that was sort of one of the things that I wanted to bring forward in this talk is how do you advocate then within your um, institution to make this happen? So pretty much I guilt people. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about um, social prescribing as well. Uh, and really the AGO recently partnered with the Alliance for Healthier Communities in a research pilot for social prescribing. And social prescribing is an innovative approach to public health. It's a means of referring people to a range of local non-clinical services, seeking to address people's needs in a holistic way and supporting individuals in taking greater control of their own health. Um, at its core, it supports elements of co-design, so co-creating solutions to accommodate needs, good data tracking, because healthcare organizations are really good at this, and then concrete referrals. So you can either be self-referred or referred into programming um, to social goods that are available in the community. The movement actually began in the UK and has now become part of conversations in Canada and Australia. And it speaks to a process that looks at the utility of non-medical interventions to address the social determinants of health. So social prescribing is a simple yet kind of transformative way of supporting patients' health and well-being by responding to their need for social connectedness. Uh, whereas community programs and other non-medical supports have always been a part of the Canadian healthcare model, which I want to acknowledge, social prescribing breaks new ground by building intentional links between health and community services. Museums and galleries can offer a space that is not only creative and inspiring, but also safe-ish, um, supportive and free from stigmatization, often associated with healthcare, providing visitors with opportunities to self-develop that are not available to them in other contexts. So that's all well and good, right? Like I've, I've told you this narrative and shared these ideas, but I also wanted to be really transparent about what our challenges are. And it's, you know, wonderful in theory. <laughs> but many museums identify as having a social role and have made great efforts to address the needs and interests of communities they serve, including the expansion of activities to socially excluded populations. So Kamek and Chatterjee propose even a framework whereby museums can develop strategic partnerships with local healthcare authorities, community centers, and organizations to coordinate health and well-being programs. And such programs can offer an on-prescription referral service designed and delivered in partnership with health and social care organizations. And methods have even been developed to evaluate the efficacy of such programs. So you can look at actually something called the Museum's Wellbeing Measure, which was developed by Thompson and uh, Helen Chatterjee. Challenges for most arts and culture organizations, however, really include how best to sustainably support outreach projects and partnerships with community organizations. Most culture sites can be innately colonial constructs and that are not always safe spaces, as I previously acknowledged. So how do we engage with community groups so that they see themselves at our sites and feel comfortable? Um, so for me, I have some key considerations for that, uh, and I'm referencing the Tate Exchange, which is a space in a program at Tate Modern that supports community debate and reflection by getting actively involved in thinking through what it means to make a difference with communities. They've shared key considerations from their research project presented by Dudney et al. in 2013. And so subjectivities of museum visitors are in constant flux. And for the museum -y people on the webinar today, we know John Falk, a leading figure in free choice learning and understanding why people are motivated to visit museums, studied individual motivations and expectations. 
And his research showed that most leisure experiences aren't initiated by a desire to see or do something specifically, but as a desire to fulfill a specific identity related motivation. And you don't live in that same motivation every time you visit. Um, he identified five basic identity related categories um, and you kind of move between them. So there's facilitators, which are often parents or grandparents or me with my partner, um, rechargers. So we know when we've gone to museums or spaces and felt just um, able to be calm and, and, and really, again, as the term says, recharge. Explorers who are I, typically tourists or finding an exhibition that they would like to spend some time in and maybe read lots of labels. And then also experience seekers. And lately I've just been referring to them as the folks that come to any Yayoi Kusama exhibition. <laughs> and then professional hobbyists, which are all of us who are on this call. So that's just an example of some of the subjectivities. We must re-envision relationships between museums and a public that is deeply embedded in the decline of the preeminence of dominant language, cultures, and nations. This is something we just need to acknowledge. Practices of collection, interpretation, and engagement in art museums are subject to revisioning in a technological information age that offers radically different possibilities for communication and representation. And we're seeing this right now with COVID and digital programming too. Um, the complexity and agency of audiences as individuals, consumers, and communities, and the ways in which audiences experience the museum will be increasingly important as the cultural value and authority of museums are destabilized. Um, museum practitioners are equally locked into a reproduction of professional operational practices without end and with few mechanisms for critical and reflective work. And so I just also want to acknowledge everyone's time and coming to this webinar because we're actually engaging in a bit of that work right now, which is nice. Um, so we're going to move on to maybe some solutions. And uh, for me, that comes in the form of co-creation. Again, something that Stephen touched upon, which was just really lovely to see in the programming. So co-creation is the collaborative development of new values, concepts, solutions, products and services, together with experts and or stakeholders, such as visitors, community members, sky's the limit. And I love this because Paulo Ferrer wrote way back in 1968, P.S., that it is absolutely essential that the oppressed participate in development with an increasingly critical awareness of their role as subjects of transformation. Ferrer sought to replace the traditional hierarchical structure of the classroom by helping the students to become, oh, look at that. Don't you love when, <laughs> Max, they're all connected. Um, so Ferrer sought to replace the traditional hierarchical structure of the classroom by helping the students to become equal contributors to the learning process. And we can see that in the free choice learning op, um, environment of the museum as well. Similarly, by co-designing processes with the museum that are determined by people with lived experience, we have found that we can create more inclusive spaces and become more appealing for people who otherwise wouldn't experience the well-being benefits of the cultural site. Another person I like to reference too is Nina Simon, who's a, really a museum visionary. Um, and she references co-creative projects that give power to the participants, provide a place for community engagement and dialogue, develop skills that will support their own individual and community goals, and often the process is co-determined by the preferences and working styles of the participants. More than any other type of visitor participation, co-creative projects challenge institutional perceptions of ownership and control of content. She, de she defines a participatory cultural institution as a place where visitors can create, share, and connect with each other around content. Create means that visitors contribute their own ideas, objects, and creative expression to the institution and to each other. Share means that people discuss, take home, remix, and redistribute both what they see and what they make during their visit. Connect means that visitors socialize with other people, staff, and visitors who share their particular interests. And the AJO is really working to become a space for collaboration and discussion building new relationships within and between communities as well. And one of the things I like to reference quite a bit for this work is uh, Natasha Reed's revised framework for active inclusion, 
which outlines how to explore collaborative processes in pedagogy and outreach um, community programming. And you can see here on this amazing um, visual, so it's a circle with arrows that are pointing around and you can't really exit the circle, so it's ongoing. And the first point is more than one dialogue between community group and the gallery prior to the first visit. And yes, oh my God, this has to be done. And two, gallery representatives visit the community center prior to the first gallery visit. And this also reminds me of something that a colleague, Judy Koch, used to say to us all the time, if you only ever invite someone to your house, but you never go to theirs, what kind of relationship is that? And then number three, connections created with new visitors from the community group during the gallery visit, super key to also showcase that the gallery is a space to visit and use as a tool. And reflection on the process by the gallery and the community group after um, the gallery visit. And this is so important um, as far as debriefing and evaluation. And then I love that this table also, or this figure demonstrates that it all starts over again um, because it should be such an iterative process. I'm gonna flick down to this slide. Um, and this is where I'm gonna go a little bit more deeply into programming. So I really could talk at length and have about our well-being support for doctors, um, you know, supporting caregivers as well as participants. Our senior social free program, much the same as uh, what's offered at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Multi-sensory programming, mental health programming, deaf culture programming, and hopefully uh, an upcoming uh, partnership with Dancing with Parkinson's for our Studio 54 exhibition. Those are all really exciting things that I'm so grateful to be able to work on. But I feel that the co-creation process in action is sort of best exemplified by a program partnership with the South Riverdale Community Health Center. Um, and partnerships for me really grease the wheels of change. Um, so with South Riverdale Community Health Center, working with peer ambassadors, so these were folks that were identified from the community and given paid positions in this role, um, were paid community representatives with lived experience, in this case with chronic pain. And we co-designed a program for building connections with the AGO, identifying it as a resource to help support their well-being. And it was very much built peer to peer. I really wanted to try and remove the authority of the museum and any facilitator from the experience. And we really did. We removed that authoritative role and prioritized the peer to peer experience in the collection with art. So Sir Kab Pirzad, who's the regional manager of chronic disease uh, management, and I met multiple times to plan. We also offered a familiarization and facilitation training with food and drink that was sort of a day long for the peer ambassadors. Uh, we offered free visits for the peers as they prepared to launch the program and the program itself is free, but just to help prep in advance. We covered transportation costs, we co-created the one hour gallery visit structure and art making workshops that happened back at the community health center. And those activities were based on the artworks that were visited during the peer to peer tours. Um, we hosted a social event to thank the peers at the AGO and we co-wrote a survey to capture some of that qualitative data and feedback as well as hosting um, a focus group to make sure that we were getting good feedback. And when we asked the participants um, what they thought about the program at the AGO, they shared that they had enjoyed themselves, that they felt calm and relaxed, which is just mwah, beautiful, felt comfortable. The peer ambassadors, they said, treated them with dignity and respect, that the peer ambassadors also met them, made them feel comfortable and welcome in the gallery, and that the peer ambassadors really helped them identify the AGO as a site that they could return to. Um, on their own and had agency to use as a way to cope with their um, chronic pain. So through this co-creative community-centered process, we're trying to undo the enlightenment mono-narrative, the authoritarian voice of the institution and prioritize personal meaning making instead. So by encouraging people to visit the gallery and make meaning of the art themselves, rather than prioritizing art history or problematic colonial narratives, we're encouraging people to socialize, make personal meaning, encourage closer and deeper looking together, be creative, all while participating in a social outing. And all of that, coming back to well-being, all of that has health benefits. Um, so I also wanted to address, uh, and sorry, just to explain, this previous slide is an exhibition that we hosted in our community gallery of artworks that were produced by some of our older adult participants in our senior social. 
um, and they were all inspired by artworks in the collection as well. So you can see next to the label that it also drives you to go up into the collections to see the original works that inspired these artists. And then here, the image on this particular slide is of our multi-sensory program. And so we can see, um, I work quite closely with the curators and uh, the con conservators to see what we can engage with in real life. Um, translations are always nice, but uh, we really try and engage with the artwork if we can through touch. And so they're wearing nitrile gloves as they encounter the sculpture. So now I'm going to talk about how all of this work has shifted <laughs> since the pandemic. So we've le really leaned into design thinking, being experimental and iterative. So this perspective has really helped manage change. We've been able to shift many programs to a digital platform in pre-recorded Zoom videos. They've launched live on our social media platforms and then live on our Access to Art resource hub. Um, and over time, we hope to populate this with many more assets. Right now, there's definitely all of the programs that I previously mentioned um, showcasing when those events are going to be launched. Uh, but what we would really like to include as well is upcoming, um, that's what I wanted to flag, upcoming partnerships with Tangled Arts and Workman Arts. So they're not-for-profit community organizations in Toronto that support artists with mental health and different abilities. So we're partnering with them to create video content. Um, and the Resource Hub acts as a central location for resources that support self-guided engagement and exchange with the gallery. So this will eventually also include trails, skill shares, virtual reality experiences, visual descriptions. There's actually already one that I launched the other week there. Community labels that we hope to produce for our upcoming I Am Here exhibition and training modules for community organizations. Um, there are a myriad of opportunities for partnerships and co-creating best practices. And I have to say that I'm actually really excited. So it's been a bit of a silver lining in this very strange time. One thing that I do want to acknowledge, though, is that the internet and technology are not accessible to many marginalized folks. So going digital has uh, increased accessibility to our programming and increased our ability to reach beyond the GTA. Um, but this is a challenge I just want to shout out and I don't have a solution for really. So I'm going to leave that hanging very purposefully. Uh, I also wanted to share some key takeaways uh, for me, at least uh, for programming. Um, and that's really that, uh, and programming for well-being, right, to bring us, just to remind us of our topic. Uh, but partnerships to facilitate health and well-being work so well and can really solve some of the gaps in services. And I think if they're transparent and both organizations acknowledge what they can bring to the table, but also what their challenges are, there's often some really beautiful things that can happen um, with honesty and, and really trusting one another. Evaluation, so evaluate and capture qualitative and quantitative da data. I'm a huge data nerd, so Stephen, when you were talking about all of those projects, I, I have to say that I was just chomping at the bit, so exciting. So, um, but also that can take place as surveys, um, focus groups, but also as we heard too from Stephen's presentation, university research partnerships are really amazing as well. And we actually did this with York University to um, study our older adults program. And it really gave not only lots of information and important stuff that I can reference and also share out, but it also gave experience to the students and really provided a rigorous study. And they also negotiated the research ethics board with the city of Toronto, which just was the best thing ever. I'm so thankful for that work. <laughs> Um, I also want to acknowledge like taking on a role of advocacy in your institution. Um, this is most of the work that I do and it actually really requires a lot of patience. Um, I often have to remind myself that you need, you, we often assume that people may know a thing, right? And uh, not everyone knows uh, what inclusion can really look like because we're almost brainwashed by the systems and structures that we find ourselves in. Um, and being able to apply that lens and help folks potentially see other alternatives is a big part of this work, I think. Innovation requires time, risk taking, commitment of resources. This is key and building on strengths. When something matters, you evaluate and you give resources. Um, and so that's also something I often uh, reiterate to the folks that I work with as well. And finally, I just have some, some final thoughts here for everyone. Um, 
and these are things I, I try and think about and how to nurture a space that aligns with well-being. So here's the first one. Those entering public space to participate in activities advertised for a specific condition, for example, eating disorder, learning disability, and mental health issue, are likely to have an immediate sense of separation, one of being on an unequal footing with other visitors. This might subsequently result in changed perceptions of identity, in turn impacting negatively upon confidence and self-esteem rather than building them. So something to be aware of, right? Uh, also, I love this. Evidence from sports psychology literature identifies a phenomenon known as home advantage. And this is by a study by Karen et al. from 2005. And this theory is helpful in considering how when visitors are asked to engage with the gallery, they're immediately placed at a disadvantage as they are almost always required to play away from home. So entering someone else's space um, and seldom ever, like, and they really seldom ever have the opportunity to have a home advantage, right? And so research identifies three factors that help to explain this inherent disadvantage. And those are a lack of familiarity with the site of play, uncertainty of the rules and nature of play within that site, and then the psychological impact of territoriality. So the strong subconscious desire of museum professionals to defend their space and rule within it as well. So the lack of familiarity with the gallery, the layout, collections, the personnel, rules, language, and practices can inhibit facilitators or visitors from feeling able to engage. And this is also closely linked to Pierre Bourdieu's concept of cultural capital, which is the accumulation of knowledge, behaviors, and skills that one can tap into to demonstrate one's cultural competence and position in society. So how do we start to think about that? And for me, it often looks like a lot of that familiarization work and co-creation too. And finally, how we make assumptions about community needs sometimes. And that's particularly problematic. And certainly I want to acknowledge that as um, like a cis white woman that has a certain amount of privilege. That's why co-creation is so important because I don't want to be programming in such a way that is unwanted or not needed and certainly not in kind of a savior esque way either. Um, so that to me is a real key final thought around this, this work. Um, really also the biggest point here is that museums can play a really powerful role in bringing about social change. We have the opportunity to enrich the quality of individual lives and to enhance our community's well-being by engaging a growing and diverse population in meaningful art and social experiences that enrich their lives. So I wanna thank everyone for um, listening and for uh, coming here today. And again, thank you, Stephen and Shannon and Maddie and Charlotte for this wonderful program. <laughs> and I'll stop sharing. Thank you, everyone. My brain is so full right now. I feel, uh, I feel like my life is very enriched hearing what you have presented and seeing these beautiful images. So my deepest gratitude for you being here. And uh, I, I'm sure I'm speaking for all of the participants as well. Um, there's been uh, quite a few people saying thank you um, in the chat. So um, let's jump into some questions. Um, and of course, what's most um, on a lot of people's minds right now is what's happening during COVID and this bringing things online. Um, what are some of the, the challenges that you've had in terms of online programming and what can you offer so that people who are watching who maybe want to jump into doing some virtual programming, what are some of your solutions or suggestions? Maybe Stephen, if you want to start. Sure, I'll also just start by thanking Melissa. That was great, so inspiring. I can't wait to steal all your ideas. Um, <laughs> thank you for invoking Nina Simon. Um, that was really, uh, was a really, really, really helpful, reassuring. I was like, oh my goodness, this. I want to be a participant. This is what it really invoked in me too. Is is how much as facilitators we. Um, forget our own well-being that happens through the things that we're trying to share. So this great question about what do we do virtually, um, I saw there was a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. 
Well, one of the things that uh, I've been able to do is use the most basic features of Zoom to connect with our partners that are able to continue supporting their membership at this time. Again, citing what Melissa underlined, which is that that is always a limitation. There are lots of folks that don't have access to high-speed internet or internet at all. Um, so there, there are technological uh, privileges that are coming with the partners that we're able to continue working with. That in mind and respect, um, much like we were doing in our presentations, we have the wealth of the museum's virtual collection at our disposal. And in fact, I've been able to visit things. We, we don't have a photography gallery, for instance, but we have an amazing, excuse me, I just have to move the cat. Um, we have an amazing photography collection. So being able to explore, I'm, I'm, I'm very hungry to look for uh, different advantages that Zoom offers. One, we get to visit parts of the collection that aren't on display. Two, we get to revisit exhibitions that have already left the museum. And three, Zoom that includes a creative component allows people to look away from the camera while remaining connected. So we invite them into a space that is at once virtually shared, um, but they're able to sort of um, negotiate that, that Zoom fatigue component by just indulging their own creative experience. And so whether it's through uh, an education um, format or through a therapy format, there's still ways that we can stay connected and it's kind of interesting that not, neither of us are at the museum. I'm not doing this from the museum, but we're kind of holding the museum, if you will, virtually. Uh, we're holding the museum as this, as this bridge that connects us. So that's a little piece. Melissa, would you like to say something about the virtual? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I agree with all of that so much. So I, I love also the removing of time constraints, right? To your point about being able, we were able to uh, re-explore some of the things in our archives. So my colleague, Boyana Stanek, that does performance, created a lovely suite of reminiscing about performances and also looking at them from the lens in which we find ourselves now. So it created additional meaning making. Um, but again, that is, that's the crux for me, uh, is that a lot of the work that I'm doing is also directed specifically to the folks who won't have this access. And so one of the things that I just want to put forward as a time where it's been a bit successful is actually working very closely with the community health centers across Ontario. And so being able to have them safely engage communities and have them come to the site to then experience the digital, um, digital programming. Um, so that's been helpful. We've also launched art talks, as you've said, Stephen, so that they're live and there's uh, reciprocation there because you can tell I, I don't like hierarchy. So I don't like authority or meaning being with one person. So that's also why that became very important. And then I can not underline also the, the notion of encouraging creativity. And so we have action calls for everyone and we have, you know, sort of synchronous, asynchronous. So you're experiencing it synchronously. That's what we're doing right now somebody will experience this recorded later, that's asynchronous, um, that we've allowed multiple entry points so that it's live and recorded. And then again, that making encouraged. So my colleague Tiana Robux did amazing work with AGO Makes as well. Um, but yeah, the biggest thing around that too is I think just experimenting and leaning into uh, design thinking, iterating, prototyping, evaluating, and then seeing what works. And for us as well um, at Agnes, we've certainly, um, as you've mentioned, our online art hive and we, we're doing this program, um, just some very basic things. Um, make, sure you're, uh, make sure you have had a number of meetings before you launch because <laughs> it's like making a show. I keep saying this, it's like making a TV show or you know, we're not making TV shows anymore, but these are shows in a way and they are being recorded. And uh, it's so different than being in the studio, being in person, the way that the camera works. We're all becoming filmmakers. You know, I can show you my hands working way at my desk here in the art hive just by moving my camera. And so it really is this radical rethinking of, uh, of, of these programs and how we can engage with the community. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I wanted to talk also about potential partners. So I know that there are some people in our audience here who are from, um, as you were talking about, uh, Ontario Health Centers, um, people coming from different community organizations. How do you, um, 
how do you make that first move if you're either somebody who wants to work with the museum or if you're in the museum and you have some ideas about some potential activities and potential partnerships. So what would be your, your suggestion, Melissa? Uh, well, to me, it's so relational. That's the one thing I always want to lead with. Um, and so that's where I reach out to me. <laughs> I'm going to just actually put in my email in the chat for everybody to see. Uh, because I think, as we've said, conversations before Zoom, conversations before programming. Um, but that's where I think the work is so rich because each each program, each community, each staff person will have different things that they want to focus on and, and meet. So to me, that's the biggest thing. And I actually also think that ties into like a little question at the, not a little, a great question, but a question at the end where it's about for emerging museum professionals too, reach out, connect, network. And to Stephen's point about us sharing so much even more, because I always uh, talk about museum studies as kind of being clandestine museology, because you kind of share and borrow and, 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 and take from one another, because also our art in the moment was designed by Meet, uh, after Meet Me at MoMA. Um, all of that, I think, is reaching out and having conversations and being people and building relationships. Wonderful. Um, so also, what's another one that I had? Um, Stephen, you were talking about radical hospitality. I love that term when people put radical in front of things. I think that's also one of those mysterious terms. Um, could you just jump into that idea? What is radical hospitality and how, as a museum, can we be radically hospitable? Um, I, I'm hesitant to impose uh, how I would embody or practice it uh, on others. So I'll share what it means to me and then those pieces that might make sense to others, they can appropriate them as needed or as, as desired. For me, radical hospitality uh, begins in appreciating that people make decisions about whether a space feels safe-ish enough um, before they know it. And that encounter with another human being who is charged with welcoming them is often um, an, an underappreciated um, kind of connective tissue. So in your, in your posture, in, your, in the pace that you speak, in the choice of voice that you use, in the in, encounter with your eyes, um, the questions that you ask and how you ask them with sensitivity, uh, all of that, if we're, if we're kind of going back to some of the, the, the more basic humanistic practices of positive regard, um, uh, non-judgmental stance, but that these are not just attitudes or labels, they're actually practices. So greeting somebody at the hive, for instance, it, it may look fairly straightforward and may even resemble like your favorite restaurant in a way, um, but we're coming up to folks and saying, it's really nice to see you, or it's really nice to see you back. And so that you're not taking for granted their, their return um, you're not taking for granted if they're coming back that you don't need to make that effort once again. Um, how are you? What brings you here? Who told you about the space? Um, are you familiar? Do you have an art there? Do you have an art practice at this time? Is there something that I could introduce you to? Just those very, very basic um, tools of communication that we sometimes underestimate. Um, can I put some tea on for you? Where in the room do you think that you might feel most comfortable at this time? When we transpose that onto a museum visit, let's say, we're also being mindful of preparing people for the, the work that we're maybe going to see and, and, and being sensitive that work is provocative, work isn't neutral, our spaces aren't neutral. It's a busy day at the museum today. So um, is there something that we can, we can do ahead of time to, to prepare uh, as a group together to, um, to enjoy this to, the, to its maximum potential. So really using um, a, a basic empowered approach as well of, of eliciting feedback from the get-go as opposed to being, here I am doing monologue, but as opposed to being um, uh, in, in presentation mode where I'm just going to impart information onto you, um, developing tools so that we get, uh, we get people on board that they are co-creators of the experience. Yeah, and Melissa was talking about not making assumptions about anyone. Um, years and years ago, I did work at the AGO, and that was something we talked about a lot, was that 
because we work there and because it's so much a part of our life, we assume that everybody is comfortable in those spaces and everybody wants to come. But there are so many people that that's just, it's so far from what they could imagine themselves being involved in because of whatever the cir circumstance is. So this, uh, this term of brave space, which Melissa, you had mentioned is so important. Like we want to of course make safe spaces, but can we truly make a safe space? Can we make a brave space? And maybe you could talk a little bit about that idea too, Melissa. I love this idea of the brave space. Well, I, it's definitely not my own, but I, I think that's something that I often chat about with my colleagues because particularly in light of um, everything that's happened during COVID uh, and how little action we've taken and how frustrating it is to have to get back into a mode of getting people to be just simply anti-racist, right? Um, a part of that is because we've all been indoctrinated into a system and structure, like, it doesn't have to exist this way, right? Like it's all a construct of our own making. Um, and when you come into a space like a museum that's designed very much with white walls, a white cube, uh, you know, and, and you, there's a speciousness to all the art and objects. There's uh, labels that tell you how to feel and think and interpret. Uh, and that's often from a colonial perspective, right? And there's often work in the museum and in the collection that's been taken in inappropriate ways. So I, I feel like I can't, and that's why I said safe-ish, because I think that we can try and make that work with programming, but until we change the boards and we change who we get funding from and we change how we engage with the notion that we are the keepers of some notion of authority, um, then I can't really lean into it being a safe space. And so it has to be brave. And we have, and when I'm having those conversations with community members, I'm very transparent because I'm saying, you know, we're gonna run into bureaucracy that is good. It, it may be a bit traumatizing for you. And so my role is to advocate for you and to be the shield for that almost. And we'll just need to agree in advance that we're gonna have those moments. They're gonna be frustrating, but this is about making the change and taking action and um, that to me is about talking about that and setting that up as, as, as braveness and working together. Hmm. I, I also had um, been thinking a lot about slowing down and you know, if we really are truly going to make change, right now we've had this opportunity forced upon us to change. <laughs> But a lot of what we're saying right now is that these kind of institutional values have, are changing and there are so many things that have to change. So how can we, in these um, positions that we're in as, as programmers, as educators, as museum workers and, and pe potential partners, um, I think just taking a breath and slowing down and actually engaging with the medicine that we are offering of art and going and, and being with those pieces and, and doing our own healing and, and wellness experiences. Um, that's, that's what's going to have to change. Um, even having um, board meetings or advisory meetings, I've been invited to certain ones and sometimes I, I will bring an activity like what you've offered to us, Stephen, um, and, and thrown something on the table and said, I'm gonna ask everybody to do something. And, and it, it, I have to be brave in asking these these folks to 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 engage in this way because um, it's not the same old same old. Can we can we do that? Can we um, can we be brave ourselves as well as uh, encouraging others to be to have that braveness in them? So I love I love talking about this. It's so wonderful. Uh, we have another question here. Someone is asking for an emerging museum professional. Do you have any advice on how to get involved in this type of work? Um, so whoever would like to jump forth and, and give some advice. Maybe Stephen? I'll put my two cents in, although I come to the, I come to the museum world fairly recently. I've only been, I've only been working with, with our museum for the last five years and only working there for the last three. And, um, and I have a very fortunate position in that I'm coming in as a mental health professional uh, with a museum that had 
um, the, the ambition to open that uh, as a position. So my particular story isn't necessarily going to be uh, a point of reference for somebody who's coming into museum culture. Um, what I've been able to notice from my colleagues in education um, is that they really have quite dynamic backgrounds, but the fine arts seems to be that which is the linchpin between all of them. Um, so whether they've done museum studies, um, art history, some have done some training in art therapy, some have done some um, specializations uh, in, in particular domains of the fine arts. Uh, they've studied certainly uh, art education, but once they're in, and I was gonna just mention this earlier about starting new partnerships. Our, our, our teams, our staffs are like a wellspring of, and museums love this word, innovation. Um, and to put, it, put a nice slow, let's put some slow innovation, let's put a word slow in front of that so that we don't get carried away too, too quickly again. But our teams have, are so um, uh, just rich in their own ambitions to work directly with people and work in less traditional ways. Uh, so if you find yourself working with a museum, whether it's uh, on a contract or you land a position um, that having uh, particular, whether it's particular publics or particular um, societal issues that are of concern to you, advocating for those within your department is often, this all, this all started in education. Museum education is like the wellspring of where all of this came from long before, when I was in still high school when some of this was happening. So the, that's, that's, the, that's the root of, of uh, how we have the Helen Chatterjee's, how we have um, uh, art therapy and museums. It comes from the ambitions of what was classically underfunded, underregarded departments in museums that are now getting some of the, of the attention that they're due. So advocate for what it is that's important to you um, within your team and, and see, and as Melissa is uh, providing such a, uh, a careful example of that, of offer to be the shield as well for your partners. It's such a, that's so perfect, Stephen, and I think that's also the thing that stands out to me most now that I think, um, as I said, museums are a tool for change, and I feel very strongly about social justice. I'm kind of just tired of the way things are, and I think that um, more so now than ever, different skill sets, um, so certainly, like, Stephen's a perfect example of um, we also have a colleague um, who works at the ROM, uh, Christian Blake, who is an occupational therapist, for instance. So bringing, and Tama Bastien was uh, and from Engineers Without Borders. So bringing these different skill sets to um, what has become a very, a structure that just wants to maintain. And so how do you get in there? And, um, and I think that's about the radical welcomes. I think that's about... Uh, sticking to your core values and beliefs. I think it's also really, and as I've said, important to connect and network. And to me in the museum world, I mean, I've seen Louis Giroux. Um, I've also seen Andrea Gumbert. Like these are, these are people that I know well and, and respect and, and love to work with. And so knowing them has been through connecting and asking questions and emailing. And I myself, whenever someone's an emerging museum professional or someone who's interested email me. I'm always happy to take some time and talk specifically about um, your experience because again, it is again, relational, right? Like there is no one way of doing it. And um, for me, like certainly I thought I was going to go into academia. I did an art history master's degree. And then I was like, what was this for? Oh no. And then went back to Ottawa where I'm from. So shout out to all the Ottawa people. <laughs> um, and uh, and then, you know, struggled to figure out what to do. And it was through just kind of getting contract positions at um, Library and Archives Canada, Deep and Bunker Cold War Museum, the National Gallery of Canada, and being interested in this work, and particularly because of a lived experience in my own family uh, dealing with mental health and um, different disabilities, that it was important to me to make space in galleries. And that was my, that was my passion. And so that manifested then when I went to Toronto to get another degree, because maybe don't do that though, because I think we should start hacking our education. And then, <laughs> and then when I was able to start working at the AGO, that that became kind of a passion project for me. So, yeah, network, connect, 
It's about relationships. I also, um, I wanted to see if you could uh, just give any advice or, or thoughts. Um, Stephen, I loved how you started off and you showed us images of your museum in the therapeutic architecture of it and the lighting and the, um, the positions of sculptures in those spaces and seating spaces. And um, I'm just thinking a lot about space right now because um, the Agnes is going to be moving into a, a rebuild um, in the next couple of years, which is really exciting for us. Um, uh, Bader Philanthropies has just donated a, a large sum for this redesign and rebuild. So, um, so I would love to use this experience to get some insight. What, what advice could you give um, to me to then bring to those um, decision makers on spaces? So if we had carte blanche to create spaces to make these sorts of um, changes happen, you know, spaces for social justice, spaces for decolonializing the museum, what would your recommendations be? Wow, what a question. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, do you want to design a museum together? <laughs> I would 100% do that because I just was writing in the chat, my one thing that I just want to say and then Stephen take it away, large elevators. Hmm. Large elevators, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite Christian once again and what he's, what he's taught me about the importance of community consultations and community consultations, not just in how we build our partnerships in education and well-being and in therapy, but community consultations in how we experience our spaces. Um, having folks that are, uh, that are experts in their respective communities come in and, and, and reflect on designs before the first two by four goes up. Um, but, or I should say, and um, in this spirit, and, and thank you for invoking slowness, Shannon, uh, in the spirit of slowness, um, some of the, the beautiful things that were put into our, our latest pavilion was um, that all of the galleries were organized at once, of course, around supporting the art, but they were really supported around the flow of human activity. And all of the galleries open up from these quite cocoon-like spaces whether it's the choice of color, lighting, et cetera, they all open up into these atriums and are connected through, um, through natural light. So every time you're leaving a space, you're entering in, in some ways back into a relationship with your environment. In this case, we're looking at Concordia University. We can see the mountain, we can see the river, we can see Leonard Cohen, we can see the uh, Charles Joseph's totem. But those interconnected spaces are often the places where people gather and um, if you can, get yourself a neuroscientist as well, because um, they have wonderful things to say about how we, um, um, on a neurological level, are experiencing the spaces that we're in, um, and even are, are now playing a more um, uh, deliberate role in how, how exhibitions either support or don't support um, our, our attunement and attentional uh, experience of how much work can we take in in a given exhibition? How many places of rest do I benefit from uh, in the different sections of an exhibition, et cetera? Love it. Thank you. I wonder um, how you would feel about asking each other a question. Is there anything, Melissa, that you would like to ask Stephen or Stephen that you would like to ask Melissa? Um, I'm looking at our, our questions here as well, and, and uh, there's some, some wonderful feedback. Um, but is there anything that you, you would like to ask each other? Stephen, please. I'd love to, to ask you a question, uh, both in your role at the museum, but also as someone who has an influential role as an educator in a university. Um, what is it that... Um, and also just listening to, to the, the theorists that you were citing that are clearly important to you. Um, this is an unfair question because it's kind of a summary. What is it that you are so, um, what's this word? It's not anxious to impart. What is it you're something you're so passionate to impart to your students, particularly at this time? That is such a good question. I'm just so, this is such a great experience today. It's just filling me with joy, but um, I think 
it really does. It's the co-creation. It's connecting with community and it's connecting with relationships. I was chatting with, a, uh, with us before we started the webinar and I, I think I'll just tell a little bit of a story that I had on Wednesday to, to exemplify the work that I do in, in that framework of, of teaching is uh, bringing in all of these bright minds um, who have a range of experiences and you know you can develop design fixation. So that was one of the things that I called out that we need to realize when you're working within these constructs, again, you can get kind of brainwashed and caught up in, in the system and structure. So um, the class is often just uh, probably more rewarding for me because I'm speaking with folks from a different perspective and bringing their lived experiences. And so I was sharing a story that on Wednesday, we, we had a co-creation session and it was hosted by actually one of my previous students. And um, really what that involves is getting people to brainstorm through a series of activities. And the goal of the class is that the students create translations that are multi-sensory. So we learn all about the senses and how those are perceived. And then they have to kind of brainstorm a translation. And I was saying that on my screen, there was a row of people and someone was calling in from Beirut. Someone was calling in from Hong Kong. Someone was calling in from, um, India and it was just incredible that it was just all of these folks from around the world and in the session they all created parts of a whole and to see that come across on the screen and I was saying I got I got a little thicklamped then but that is I and I still am because it's really beautiful when you're able to connect in that way and think about solutions that may not hit everything but certainly we have to move away from this notion that there is one person that has the authority or the power or the knowledge to answer things. And so the more we integrate um, connecting with multiple voices into how we design and how we program, the better all of that will be and the more we'll break down the toxicity that is part of our culture. I'd love to hear more about the sensory programming that you've done. Um, we were so fortunate enough to bring in Carmen Papalia, who I'm sure you know of. Carmen, shout out to Carmen Papalia, who led our, our gallery visitors on what he calls a see for yourself tour. And Carmen is a man who lives as a blind man. He, he considers himself a non-visual learner. He doesn't want to say that he's blind, but he's a non-visual learner. And so for, for us to bring him in, I think it was one of these moments where life was thrown up on its head because people thought I'm coming to take a look at some beautiful artworks with my eyes. And actually we asked our visitors to close their eyes and to experience the space. And so they all reported that it was a life-changing, not all, but many people felt it was a really life-changing experience, including myself. Um, so Melissa, can you speak a little bit more about some of the sensory programming that you've done and, and some of the outcomes that you've seen? Absolutely, yeah. And I'm just putting in one of my favorite um, publications from Carmen Papalia. We have never actually met. <laughs> and this is also my role has switched quite a bit uh, uh, recently just in the new year. So I'm able to lean more into community programming. So it's coming. I, I feel it. Um, but I think uh, so really the work that I've done, it also originates from the National Gallery of Canada because I know Andrea is on this call. So I just want to shout out the incredible experience and training that Gary Goodacre and the team, um, uh, Beatrice Jardin, all of that uh, originated there with their Stimulating the Senses program. Um, but for me, it's about acknowledging that we are so ocular centric, even more so now because we're in this space of, of screen everything. It's changing our brains. It's changing our eyes, like literally our physiology. Um, and I also feel very strongly about part of decolonization is also about being embodied, right? And I remember doing this workshop with Peter Moray, who's also an instructor at OCADU um, and does really important work advocating for indigenous ways of knowing. And he had us um, at a Canadian Art Gallery Educators Conference try and stare into one another's faces. And this is when we were in real life. And it was virtually impossible for people to do that for any extended period of time. And then he also had us try and make sounds 
really loudly. And it was also really hard. Like I physically felt a barrier to being able to make sound loudly in a space. And that is capitalism, that's colonialism, that's constructing how we engage in the world, right? And so to me, part of getting us to remember our senses, the Tate Sensorium is another really great example where they set up an exhibition where there are like things you can taste and smell and hear and feel um, to kind of liven up their artworks. That's an experience that we know by doing that means that folks will remember it better, right? Because our, our senses actually imprint that memory on our, our brains. Um, and it also means that you form a different relationship then to the space. Like museums have a smell even. So even when we're not actively trying to get you to think outside of that white box, there's, there's still an experience that's relevant to just going to the site. Um, and we launched a multi-sensory digital program because I know it's going to be like, okay, well, at, at, in the program on site, what we would do is we ha had digital representations of things that we couldn't touch because unlike um, history muse and museums and ethnographic museums, we usually have like one of a thing <laughs> and it's flat. <laughs> if you're thinking of a Picasso. So we really worked with uh, 3D imaging and digitizing those to make 3D prints of that so that you could feel, for instance, the brush strokes and, and uh, bringing up the forms that are in the painting. We work on visual description, Kat Germain, I'm also shouting out her name because she's fabulous with training on how to do that. We engage with scents that are contained um, and so that you can smell while you're around certain works as well. Um, and that people can opt in uh, to or opt out of. We have sounds. So one example of that is where we were in, um, oh, Picturing the Americas was the name of the exhibition. <laughs> and there was a, a painting of the Iguazu Falls and a painting of Niagara Falls. And what we did there was play the different sounds of the falls. And that was actually very moving to the group because it, and in anecdotally, or I call it anecdata, um, they were like, uh, you know, that really gave a sense to the size that we couldn't maybe visually describe as well. There, I mean, I just, anything at all. And then the students through that course that I teach come up with a myriad of different solutions. We've had people create sound narratives because their backgrounds were film students. We've had people who were artists reproduce like these, these crazy, um, you know, not even 3D versions of something. I'm, what's the word I'm looking for? They were made out of um, like model clay. And so they used resin to remodel. And um, in the particular painting I'm referring to, which is never do this, because the first rule of interpretation is never to talk about something that isn't in front of someone, but I'm going to do it for time's sake. <laughs> there was a, a suitcase in the painting. So when you open, they found a suitcase that resembled the painting. And then when you open it, you could see the figure inside. So those are the things. And then for the digital version, what we've done is we've called out household items that you may have around you that you can use to get scent or touch that would be similar to inspiring you to engage with the, the painting in an embodied way. I'm talking too much, but that you got me started on multi-sensory and obviously I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. I loved what you were saying about, um, you know, just being able to make noise. Where can we do that? Well, and everybody shushes each other at a museum. And when you're making noise, you're learning. And this is so, I don't know. I know. That's why I've always loved being an arts educator because I would go into school rooms and the children were so excited that the art teacher was there because then they could talk when they were learning, talk to each other. It seems like uh, <laughs> that's how people learn, right? When we share and, and emote and, you know, grow in these ways, so. Um, well, and, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, but that's our opportunity right now. Like we're in the midst of almost a reset, but that, that doesn't have to be the way, right? Like we can all work here as the community that's come together to make sure that we undo those constructs. Like so silly. We have the power to do that. And again, I thank you so much, Shannon, for bringing us together to have these important conversations. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's, uh, I was just going to say about um, making noises, how great we can just mute ourselves. So, <laughs> you know, I can look at this beautiful painting behind you, mute myself and scream because sometimes that's the type of joy that comes through my body when I see art. I want to emote. So 
I love that, that, that that's what digital, you know, this new digital world is allowing us the potential to do this. So we have two more minutes. Um, I would love to just uh, wrap this up with um, what is your vision for wellness? What, 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 if you could imagine anything, what would be your vision for wellness and how could art play a part? If you could just wrap it up succinctly in like one, one minute. Each of you. Let's start with you, Stephen. Um, I think that art is going to be, uh, I think that art is currently an undervalued tool for us to have the most uncomfortable of conversations that we need to have. And that is going to contribute to all of our wellness. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. I would say um, radical empathy, radical empathy around trying to understand what an artist is trying to achieve and also um, radical kindness, kindness with ourselves that we are powerful, we make meaning and to just highlight that and that what an amazing thing art is as a conversation starter, just to Stephen's point. Wonderful. Well, we are now uh just about to flip into three o'clock. So again, my biggest gratitude, um, I'm so thrilled to have had this conversation with you. And thank you everyone who's joined us today. Uh, we will be putting this recording up, um, an edited version. So all of those wonderful resources that both Stephen and Melissa have been sharing with us will be available. And uh, we will most likely have a transcript as well. So do stay tuned and we'd love to see you again as part of the Art and Wellness Speaker Series the next two Fridays coming up in October. Thank you again, Stephen and Melissa and all the best. Um, I will most likely be reaching out again soon. Let's keep this dialogue going. Yes. <laughs> Bye everyone, thank you for being here.